guys. Um, I think this is my 15th program here at the library over the years. We've been doing a lot of fun stuff. Um, we're going to talk about, as Matt was saying, in three parts. Uh, today we're going to talk about the early part of the, of the space program. Um, then next week is Apollo. And then the third week we're going to talk about what's coming after Apollo. Like, are we going to land on planets? Send people to Mars? Uh, we're going to explore that in, uh, in the last session. Uh, I am a planetary astronomer. I am eh, retired-ish. I'm retired from uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, where I was working on the Kepler mission. Kepler is looking for exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars. Um, I say retired-ish because I'm still funded through the National Science Foundation. I still do work. Um, my research now is at Cranbrook, the Cranbrook Institute of Science. Uh, I'm an outreach astronomer there, and I'm there every Friday and Saturday night. And I welcome you to come by and, and check out our programs there. So let's dig in. So here's the program is, uh, is going to look like. Uh, today, the first baby steps about the program, Sputnik and uh, uh, the first manned space flights, uh, because unfortunately we didn't do much with woman space flights. Part two next week to the moon and exploring uh, the neighborhood in our solar system. And then uh, part three is the shuttle, the space station, and uh, well, we're going to go beyond that. So this is... I just thought I'd throw there. This is where I usually answer questions. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, where we address those well enough. Yes, I'm at the library. I'm going to use every opportunity to use a book cover. DK makes good books, by the way. So we got all questions caught up. Let's dig in. Who saw the solar eclipse two years ago? Who saw it in the path of totality? Missouri, or who, who saw it here? OK. I'm going to make the case that seeing it here is nice, seeing it somewhere else is really, really worth it. So we have our, our next total solar eclipse is coming up in 2024. That yellow band across the United States is uh, where it's going to uh, cross the country. Map version of that. Um, it is close to us. This is a very important thing for uh, chasing eclipses. This is a weather map on April 8th. Year after year after year, this is the average of good and bad skies across the country. Blue is good, meaning fewer clouds. Red is bad, like over in Washington State and that area, that's bad. We're kind of eh. So um, I'm, I'm going to show you where I'm planning on being. But if the weather's bad, I'm not going to stay. Just so you, Where's Michael? He said he was going to be here. So here's the path across uh, our area. And oh, I'm going to go back because that I was expecting in animation. Oh well. So pretty close to Niagara Falls. That's a great place. Uh, how about at uh, Cedar Point? You can sit right uh, on top of a roller coaster if they're open. <laughs> That'd be a fun place to see an eclipse. I am going to be, and I was really hoping I, was, I had an animation here, right here. Right there. I-75 crossing uh, the path of totality. I'll get about the color bands in a minute. But right there in Wapakoneta, Ohio, is the Neil Armstrong Museum. And I've already made arrangements. We, we are spreading NASA astronomers across the entire eclipse path like we did in 2017. Uh, and I've already got dibs on uh, being in Wapakoneta. Uh, but if it's cloudy, I'm going to look at the satellite view and I'm going to move. So if, if you show up there and say, where's Michael? Sorry, I love you all, but I'm going somewhere. So the blue lines, top and bottom, are the extent of where you can see the total eclipse. Beyond that, it's a partial eclipse. And I'll give examples of what that means in a minute. The red line is where the eclipse is deepest, the longest. So as close as you can get to the red line, the better off you're going to be. Well, there's the animation I wanted. That's a little late. That's me. That's where I I'm planning on being. So Toledo, just barely in it. Um, Cleveland, there's a NASA center, by the way. Uh, right about there, the John Glenn Research Center is there. So that's, <coughs> that whole stretch would be a good, good place to watch. This is where I was for the eclipse in, uh, in 2017. That is Springfield, uh, Tennessee. Nice little town. There's the courthouse and the central, uh, uh, the, the central square for the city. Uh, I had 10,000 people there uh, for the eclipse. I was the only... While there were some people set up with telescopes, I was the only person set up with telescopes to share. Everybody else, literally, there they they was a group of people with 
10 or 15 telescopes with yellow caution tape around them <laughs> saying, stay away. But we had a DJ up on the steps right there and a live band on the other side. And, and it was a real party. And, we were, um, and because I brought telescopes I was sharing, I was, I was very popular. Uh, but these are pictures I took. This is what the eclipse looked like in totality. This is the difference between a partial eclipse and a total eclipse. A partial eclipse, you see most of the sun covered, even when it gets to 99%. Yeah, that's cool. But it would go to 100%, to go to path totality is amazingly different. This is one of nature's most beautiful events. I put it up there with uh, massive northern lights, aurora borealis, um, the, the kind of things that, except you can't predict aurora like you predict an eclipse. Um, seeing a partial eclipse is like watching kitten videos on YouTube. <laughs> Going to a total eclipse is like having your arms filled with kittens. Big difference. Nice, nicer. So we, when the moon is covering the sun, which is what a solar eclipse is, uh, we can see the, the uh, solar flares, the, the, um, the sun's activity around the perimeter. And we, uh, I used a different camera so I could see the sun's atmosphere called the corona. And this is my favorite picture right there. You see this. In fact, you see it better. The camera cannot do what the human eye can. So we're talking about solar eclipses. This is a lunar eclipse, an eclipse of the moon. And the moon goes through the Earth's shadow. This was in January. Uh, this is photographed from the Cranbrook Institute of Science at our observatory there. And I'd I'll talk more about that because I'd love to have you come out and, and show you around the sky there. So let's take it back. This is what space looked like to me when I was Lucy's age. You can see the gray in my beard. It was a very long time ago. Uh, but I started off with a space program that had um, Jupiter and its 12 known moons. Jupiter has 79 moons that we know of. If I had been giving this presentation a year ago, I would have been talking about the 67 known moons. Uh, we've been finding world after world after world as we've been visiting these places. Uh, it talks about Venus and its uh, jungles, uh, Mars and its canals. Uh, look at those rings on Saturn. I'll show you some real Saturn pictures in a moment, but it does not look like that. Uh, this, is what the space, this is what space looked like before you go there. Ceres is a world, not whatever the heck that shape is. That, that's just strange. So the biggest gift we got from the space program is that Earth became a place, that the solar system became a place. Uh, not a hypothetical, not a piece of art, but a place that you can go to and you can visit. Uh, even from just the standpoint of having the global view, of seeing weather patterns. Uh, all too often, you would not even know if a hurricane was going to slam into your coast unless you're lucky enough that the sailing ship was fleeing it and it got there a day before say, hey! Take shelter. Um, otherwise, I mean, now we can track hurricanes days, weeks in advance. Now, here's a question for you guys, for you kids. Where does space start? What do you think? Where does space start? Uh, no one knows. No one knows. Well, I've got an opinion. Where does space start? No eh. What do you think? Where does space start? As soon as you leave Earth's atmosphere. That's a pretty common answer. I'd answer that's not quite as far away as that. Here's, here's the case I would make. This is, not, this is an astronomer's point of view. If you talk to somebody who is a pilot, you talk to an astronaut, they go right with what you said, Olive. It is the atmosphere. Uh, above that is the heavens, and below that is, is Earth and Earth stuff. Uh, but here's, here's my argument. As a planetary astronomer, if you are walking on the moon, you're walking on the moon. You, you had your, your spy suit. You're bouncing around because there's half the gravity. Would you think, wow, I'm in space? Probably. Probably. If you're walking around on Mars, would you think, wow, I'm in space? Is Mars a planet? Yes. Is Earth a planet? Yes. <laughs> Same difference. We study other worlds so we can understand our own world better. I study planets. I don't study the other planets. I study all the planets, Earth included and so do the other worlds to understand our own better. Where does the Milky Way start? Right here. We're in space right now. So I get people ask, have you been in space? And I'll say, yes. Yes, I have. 
By the way, as a younger man, I did apply to be an astronaut. Uh, they had 150,000 applications. I'm, they took eight. Uh, I'm sure I was like 13th or 14th. I was this close. <laughs> so I'm going to put this all to scale. This is one exercise. If you come in the second and third weeks, I will repeat this because I think this is fundamental. I'll do it really quick at the start. But you're going to, if you come back next week, and I hope you do, we're, we're going to do this. Uh, I was vacationing out in Utah near Moab. Arches National Park, beautiful place, lovely place. Took the picture of uh, the full moon rising down uh, this, uh, this highway. And I had this idea, well, what if people have a hard time understanding how big the planets are? So what if we replaced the moon with Mars? If we took Mars and put it at the same distance from us as the moon is, about a quarter million miles away, Moon looks that big in our sky. In fact, you go out tonight, you can see the moon if it's, if it's still clear. And Mars will look like that in our sky. Pretty big. Pretty big. Venus, very bright. Venus is the third brightest thing in our solar system after the sun and the moon. Um, and Venus is about the same size as the Earth. Venus is Earth's evil twin sister. Does anybody here have an evil sister? <laughs> Lucy raises her hand, yep. <laughs> and Olive does as well. Now, before I go on, a little show and tell. Sir, what's your name? Hi. Yeah. Elsa. Elsa, I need your help. Come up here. Michael, good to meet you. So, would you hold the earth for me, please? But it's the earth, 7 billion people, all depending on you. Don't drop it. Okay. Don't lick it. It's a small, never mind. Okay, so if we shrank the entire huge ginormous earth the size of a basketball, then the moon, oh, you mooned us. No mooning, no licking. Okay, come on up here. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Amani. Amani. Okay, and Amani, you always face your audience and smile. So, smile, so there we go, okay. Now, to scale, this is about the same, this, if we reduce the Earth about the size of a basketball, this is how big the moon is. Now, to be honest with you, it's a little big, but close enough, I mean, for a toy store. That, to scale, that is how big the Earth is compared to the moon. Now, if that's the scale size, we can also do the scale distance. So, are these guys, if, if you're, how, the scale distance between the Earth and the moon, are these guys too close together, too far apart, or just right? What do you think? How many think that they are too close together? How many think they're too far apart? How many, I mean, that's good because they can't much closer. How many think that's about just right? Okay. Go a few steps that way, a few steps that way. Are we there yet? No? no? Keep going. Keep going. You hold there. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Stop! <laughs> Keep going. Stop. There we go. If we reduce the Earth to the size of a basketball, the Moon to the size of about a softball, that is to scale the distance. Fifty years ago, we were in the 50th anniversary of Apollo. Fifty years ago, we sent people to land on the Moon. That is to scale how long the journey, how far the journey was. It took two and a half days. Okay, come back here. Okay, Luce, come up here. Lucy, could you hold Mars for me? Always face your audience and smile. I think that's smile right there, okay. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I never met you guys. Uh, young lady, could you help me? I could use your help. And sir, come on up. I'm coming to you. Not this time, okay. So come on, join the group. Planet Mercury, always face your audience and smile. There you go. Okay. And Pluto is still a planet. I don't care what they say. Uh, in, this observ in this observatory, that's what I'm used to say, uh, when, around me, Pluto has been and should always be a planet. I have a doctorate in planetary astronomy from the University of Canterbury. Yes, it's a planet. Okay. No? Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you for joining us today. Okay. You can get, no, 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 come back here. I'll explain why you're wrong in, in a little bit. But <laughs> yes, that is the book answer. I am the, in the part of the loud minority who think they messed up. Now, question for you guys. There's most of the inner solar system. Um, Venus, about the same size. 
Mercury, Mars, um, is Jupiter. Is the planet Jupiter bigger than the Earth, smaller than the Earth, about the same size? Bigger. Bigger. Okay, good. So we're going to get to that in a minute. Is the Sun bigger than the Earth, smaller than the Earth, or about the same size? Bigger. Bigger. Ooh, you guys are very knowledgeable, except for the Pluto thing. I'll forgive you. Okay, good. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. So go have your seats. Thank you for your help. How about a round of applause for our helpers there? That was our gate. Thank you for not mooning us. Appreciate it. <laughs> Although I, I do need, hang on to that for me. I'll need that in a minute. So if we uh, go a little further out in the solar system, size-wise, uh, there's Venus. How about Uranus and Neptune? You can fit 100 Earths, roughly, 94 or 93. I like round numbers, though. 100 Earths would fit inside of uh, Uranus and Neptune. But let's go ahead and get to the big guys. If we took out the moon and replaced it with Saturn, that's how big Saturn would be. Come on up. Come on up. Okay, hold up, hold up the earth like up against the screen. That is, that's actually not even a very good scale. It's 800 earths would fit inside of Saturn. So I would say this picture is about half the size of what I need. We need a new projector. <laughs> Big screen. Okay, hold that thought. The rings, by the way, if you could fit 800 earths inside, Saturn would actually be from the ceiling, not to the floor, but halfway down to the lower, le the next level down. Like, you'd be walking around downstairs, and you know, I guess the, uh, um, the youth library is right here. The, the activity room is right here, isn't it, downstairs? Friends story. Friends, okay, friends area. So you're walking around, all of a sudden, boom, you, you bang your head on suits. What is Saturn doing here? The rings, by the way, even on the same scale as the Earth right there, the rings would go all the way out to Main Street, down around uh, the, the towers past Detroit Taco, landmark for me, uh, the other side of the farmer's market and all the way around City Hall. That's how big the rings are on this scale. Remember we did Earth the Moon <laughs> and it filled this room? The rings are, are much, much bigger than that. But hey, we've been, we've been playing around. What, what's the biggest planet in our solar system? Thank you. Moon, Jupiter. You can fit a thousand Earths inside of Jupiter. So if we have, if, if, if um, I'm not quite to scale anymore. But Jupiter would be big enough to go from the ceiling all the way to the floor down below us. Jupiter is two stories tall on this scale right here. This storm right here is hurricane. It's called the Great Red Spot because astronomers are horrible at naming things. Dark matter, dark energy, Great Red Spot. Um, because it's big and it's red. But what, what are we going to call this? Why? Hey. I can tell you two wicked facts about the Great Red Spot. It's a hurricane that's been going for at least 400 years. And I say at least 400 years because the first telescopes were invented by Galileo and friends 400 years ago, and they saw it there. It might be 400, 4,000, 4 million years. We don't know. We don't know what the energy source is to, to just drive this perpetual cyclone. Second wild fact is you could fit the Earth and Venus and Mercury and Mars and Pluto. There's always room for Pluto. Pluto's like Jello. There's always room for Pluto. All of them would fit inside that storm. By the way, if you come to visit me at Cranbrook, uh, we're actually watching the storm come apart. We've seen it get bigger and smaller over time, but it seems to be tearing off streamers right now. And this might be the last years of the Great Red Spot after 400 years of watching it. We don't know. It's kind of like, oh, this is different. Thank you very much. Nice job. Yes? Hurricane is driven by temperature differences and uh, an engine that would drive those differences. On Earth, it's the ocean, the warm, the energy source comes from the ocean and the air swirling above it. Uh, there are different energy sources there. There's not a, a water source per se, but the atmosphere is thick and dense and in different layers. In fact, you see those stripes going back and forth? Um, those are jet streams, kind of like Earth's jet streams, except they're going past each other about 1,000 kilometers an hour. Each band is going in a different direction. So the colored bands are going that way, the white bands are going this way, and you can see in between them the shearing. 
and we can actually see the great red spot rotate as those two cloud bands go past each other. So yes, if we can figure it out, this will help us understand hurricanes, what storms are like. Finding out the outliers is always makes it easier to figure out the more common stuff. So we've been always looking up into space. We've always trying to figure out what their universe is like. Ever since we could, we could look up the sky and say, wow, that's, that's, uh, those little lights in the sky are very pretty. I wonder what they're all about. We have built observatories to, uh, to watch these things. What observatory is that? Stonehenge uh, in England. Um, uh, if you're driving to Colorado, I've got family in Durango. You go through Nebraska, you need something to do. There's Carhenge. <laughs> or a little project I do with my, I've got two daughters, by the way, uh, just kind of like you two girls right here. They're named Trouble and More Trouble. <laughs> and uh, we made Spudhenge. But this is all pre-telescope, where we thought we had a universe that was some cross between magic and mechanics, and trying to figure that out. And what changed all that is the invention of the telescope. That's Galileo showing off his uh, telescope to his friends. Telescopes have gotten a wee bit better. This is the European Southern Observatory. Uh, yes, we fire lasers. I'm sorry, a laser. We fire lasers into space so we can help focus our telescopes. Yeah, uh, Austin Powers is a great astronomy film. Um, to, you guys aren't old enough yet. And um, then we put telescopes in space. That's my mission. That's Kepler, which is looking for exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars. Um, but, you know, it's just, there's no substitution, no substitute. Pictures are great. Slideshows are great. Uh, the things I'm showing you today I think are great, but there's no substitute for actually seeing the stuff. Um, whether you can uh, visit, uh, or have some astronomer come to your school, like I did there, and uh, show off the sky a wee bit, um, or come to Cranbrook and check that out. That's our observatory at Cranbrook. By the way, we've, we've, our observatory is built in 1930. Our original telescope was 1928. And it was original from 1928 until three years ago. And then we put it all away, and we, we've thoroughly modernized the observatory, so it looks like this. While the inside is thoroughly modern, the outside is still a little rustic. <laughs> yes, Olive. It has rings, but not like Saturn. Its rings are, are dark and subtle. Uranus and Neptune also have rings. Uh, in fact, if we'd gone back to that, remember that old poster I showed you when I was a little kid? You know, Mars has canals, and Venus has dinosaurs, and um, it didn't show rings. I actually have an atlas that my grandma gave me back when I was about your age, and atlas of the world, but there was a section for astronomy. And as we found things out, I, kept, I started drawing in rings around Jupiter, adding more dots for moons until there's not enough room in there anymore. Yes, Armani. Yeah, you. Well, believe the proof of your own eyes. <laughs> we have to make sure we observe while the turtle is sleeping, so we feed him lettuce before we get started. So he's nice and calm and rested, otherwise it just starts swaying back and forth. No, the observatory is not on the back of a giant tortoise. <laughs> not a turtle, tortoise, by the way. <laughs> so we started developing ideas. Boy, you know, we might actually have a space program someday. It might actually start to look like something like this. And we left behind the world of imagination and went to the world of where we're actually starting to build hardware, the first rockets. And this is uh, the first rocket science. <laughs> OK, all I need to review the rules, you ladies. You ladies listening? The rules? You kids listening? There's no laughing, dancing, prancing, wiggling, jiggling, giggling, <laughs> hopping, popping, bopping. Those are the rules. No, 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 no. Lucy, no giggling. What about uh, you may chortle. An occasional hearty guffaw is OK. No giggling. So this is the first thing we've succeeded to put into, into space. 
And now I'm using space not as, as I defined it, space starts here and goes for, up forever, uh, but as um, rockets and astro um, astronauts and pilots define it uh, in Earth orbit above the atmosphere. Launched on uh, uh, a, a definitely a sword beaten into a plowshare, an ICBM missile. This first mission was called Sputnik, about the size of a beach ball. The, it, it, it was beeping. Beep, 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 beep. That's all it did just as a proof of concept to show that it go around the world. And uh, it really took the United States by surprise because we thought of uh, the Soviet Union as being very backward scientifically, uh, technologically. Uh, we were pretty smug in our superiority here in the United States. And uh, we were quite shocked that uh, they succeeded in putting this thing to orbit. Because if you have a rocket that can put something into orbit, you have rockets that can put a nuclear bomb anywhere on the planet. Uh, there was part of the public that became very excited by the idea, and part of the public became very scared by the idea. Um, this is the Sputnik song, the Sputnik dance. Now, I have been asking for years, because I'm just not old enough to know, what does the Sputnik dance look like? I've asked my parents, who are old enough to know, and they refuse to tell me. I don't know if there's anybody here that could uh, elucidate what the Sputnik dance looks like. I'd, I'd love to see it. Uh, but astronomers and engineers around the world started listening in. This is a group at MIT. And by the way, that's my dad right there. Yeah. My dad went to work on, uh, went to Bell Labs and worked in uh, the space program. Um, he, he worked on uh, uh, satellite communications between ground and astronauts, ground stations around the planet and, and uh, Australia and, and so on. And um, actually, uh, yeah, that's what he did for Bell Labs. What? 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 Why would somebody even want to put a nuclear bomb I've been wondering that same question all my life. Why? It was a little quietly. Why would somebody want to drop a nuclear bomb on somebody from space? Ask your mother. Uh, <laughs> you had a question, I, I forgot. I'm sorry. Uh, because it was um, easy to build a, a pressure sphere. Uh, if you want to build something that's pretty simple, um, like a dive tank, think of a dive tank being cylindrical. Um, you want to have the, the pressure to hold the, the pressure inside uh, and to heat it and insulate it. That is the simplest form. No hard edges. Uh, you'll hold your heat the best. So that's why they built it that way so, as for the first one. So how many miles up was it? Because I remember as a kid watching it go over. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was the a size of a beach ball or you know, sort of the size in relation to that. How do you actually see it from that distance? Uh, first of all, we don't have the light pollution then that we do now. Right. We have much darker skies back then. Right. Um, the light pollution is horrible, and that's, that's kind of getting into next week's seeing stuff. Um, and also, it's the only thing moving in the sky at that point. So it's right. <laughs> And it was trumpeted at 6.03 tonight in the northwest, going that away. And you go outside, wow, there it is. So how far was it? Um, I would guess I have to look it up, but about... 150 miles, about 220 kilometers. Um, it, it lasted in space, doing this by memory, four months before Earth's atmosphere brought it down. Uh, I don't think its orbit was circular. I think it was uh, elliptical. So on each pass, it would, it's perihelion or periapsis, it would actually run in Earth's atmosphere a little bit and slow it down. Oop, wrong way. Sorry. Yeah, beep, 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 Sputnik dance, la, la, la. You Sputnik dance for us, Lucy? How do you think this should go? It's got a beat, you can dance to it. So, after you launch the first thing into space, what's the next thing you do? Launch a dog, of course. Seems, seems quite logical to me. Uh, so they, they launched a dog named Laika. Laika was, uh, is Russian for Little Barker, but Laika was a very friendly pup. I think you get a sense of that in that picture there. Uh, she was actually a stray that was picked up from the streets of Moscow. And um, one of the scientists, maybe even the scientist has arms right there, uh, getting her suited up. But one of the scientists said, I made sure that she came home every night so she had 
some normal life with my kids um, before she went into space. So they put her in a capsule and they launched her off. And then comes the hard part. Now I get the question once in a while, a kid asks, well, how long was she up there? Where is she now? Did she have a good time? No, no, and no. They figured out how to send something up. They didn't quite yet figure out how to bring it down. So Laika was up for a while, and then she passed away in her capsule in space, which the capsule looked like that. That's how big Laika's capsule was, give you a sense for its size. Uh, take a look at compared to the size of that man, because we're going to compare this to the United States' best effort at the time. That capsule was pretty darn big compared to our first attempt, which was described as a grapefruit. That's, that's a pretty big grapefruit. I, I'd call that more of, um, more of a cantaloupe size. But not only were our satellites smaller, and they had to be smaller because our rockets were smaller. They weren't as powerful as the Soviet rockets. We had a problem with our rockets blowing up on the pad. Now, it was called explode nick or fail nick. So not only were we very concerned that the Soviets had big rockets and they could put a nuclear bomb somewhere, and that was scary, we couldn't respond in kind. We had what was called a missile gap at the time. So we got, uh, got going, and eventually uh, a team from the United States Army said to the President, we can launch something within uh, 90 days. And uh, this is what it was, and it was successful lifted off and sent our first mission, first American item into space, which is called Explorer 1, which looks like this. So those three guys there on the right is uh, Fanner von Braun, a uh, German rocket scientist, and uh, his, his um, legacy is mixed. Given the age of the audience, I'll kind of leave it at that, but yes, that is unfortunately a mixed legacy. Uh, on the right-hand side is James Webb, who's the administrator of NASA. I'm sorry, the left-hand side is, is Webb. And uh, the space telescope that we might eventually someday build, they've been working on it forever, the Webb Space Telescope is named after him. In the middle is uh, James Van Allen. Uh, the Van Allen radiation belts were discovered based on the experiments in Explorer. I'm going to go back a couple of slides because there's an interesting story from the space age. Back to Leica's capsule. There. That picture on the left-hand side was taken at a World's Fair in Belgium. That is a, uh, a backup model of uh, the, the, um, the Sputnik 2 spacecraft that the Soviets very proudly, for propaganda purposes, put it on world tour. So it was in Belgium at this World Expo and people could see it. The CIA <laughs> broke into the museum at night and actually stole oh. that device. <laughs> That's a little piece of history you don't hear. It wasn't us. We didn't take it. But we were so concerned because they were launching stuff that big, and we were launch, trying to launch stuff that big. And it was not going well. So what do you do after you launch the first satellite and you put the first animal in space and you have a great picture of the United States uh, contribution to the project? How about to the moon is the next thing that uh, the Soviets decided to do. Uh, their mission was the, uh, the uh, Lunik, Lunik 2 crashed into the moon. No cameras, but it uh, showed that they could actually hit the moon. Harder than you might think it is, given how dependable, ro undependable rockets were at the time. And their second mission actually flew past the far side of the moon, and we have, for the first time, images of the far side. The left-hand image was taken by, by Luna 3. Uh, the right-hand side was taken by uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, much more modern. Funny thing about the moon. So the moon has the near side, the side that always faces the Earth. So let's say that you're the Earth, the moon goes around you once a month, 
and it rotates once a month. So the same side is always facing you. We always see the same side, the near side of the moon. Now there, that's not quite, to be precise, uh, quite accurate. There's a little bit of what we call libration, a little bit of wobble this way and this way. The moon gets a little further away, a little closer. So we see almost 60% of the moon total. But that's it. The far side of the moon was never seen until this. And now to the discoverer goes the naming rights. So here's the Sea of Moscow, and all these other features are named after, by, the, by the Soviets and the Russians, uh, given names that honor Russian history and whatever else they thought was important. Because they got there first. OK, well, we decided, well, we need to do the same thing. We were definitely following at this point. Uh, the Soviet program was in the lead. They were the first to put a satellite in orbit, uh, the first to launch an animal into space, the first missions to the moon. So we have something called Surveyor. That's a Surveyor spacecraft, and its mission was to crash into the moon. The first successful Surveyor was Surveyor 7, because Surveyor 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and, and, and yes, 6 all failed in one way or another. Rocket blew up, or the fairing, the part that the nose cone didn't open, so it got stuck, or it missed the moon. Oops! Missed. We missed. It was so close. And then finally, on Surveyor, excuse me, on Ranger 7, we uh, succeeded. And these are the pictures as it goes diving in. So we could, it took us a while. But the important thing on, on these types of missions is to show how difficult spaceflight is and the type of steps we have to go through to make sure that we can safely send people into space. So while this says 50 years, this poster is well dated. We are now 60 some years since the beginning of the space age with uh, Sputnik. And now we have a global view of what our planet is like. And we have so, so many satellites surrounding our planet. There are somewhere around 3,000 functional satellites in orbit. There's another 10,000 dead or defunct satellites and a little over 100,000 bits and pieces that uh, NORAD uh, follows to make sure they don't slam into astronauts or into other spacecraft. Uh, who here saw the movie WALL-E? Um, uh, we had to leave the Earth and they couldn't come back because there's so much garbage in orbit that you couldn't fly through or, or back. Um, we're not that far from that point. That, that was not totally fantastic. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, two satellites that uh, accidentally collided and spewed out all sorts of pieces going everywhere. And that was uh, a problem for stuff that was in similar orbit. Uh, every couple of months, the space station, where we have astronauts living, the space station has to fire up its rockets and move because something's coming in. And when that's happening, the astronauts go into their emergency capsule just in case. It was an, if you saw the movie Gravity, not, not too accurate a movie, but fun. Uh, gives you an idea of what it's like if you're inside a space station when it's getting slammed into by stuff. Um, the worst example of that is the uh, Chinese. The worst recent example is the Chinese decided to prove that they have anti-satellite weapons by using their Chinese anti-satellite satellite to blow up an old, dead Chinese weather satellite. So they went up there, they intentionally crashed into it, spewing pieces, and unfortunately its orbit is very similar to the space station. So it's, it's kind of like going down the freeway behind a dump truck and you get the sand and rocks hitting you. Except in space, that stuff is not traveling at 100 miles an hour hitting you. It's traveling at 17, 18, 20,000 miles an hour. So even a fleck of paint can put a hole through the side of your spacecraft. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. After sending satellites in space, yeah, what's next? Let's send people. That is the first human to go into space. His name is Yuri Gagarin hero of the Soviet Union, and he launched into space in uh, Vostok. Um, interesting thing about um, aeronautical records, hi guys, come on in, is that you have to, to get an official aeronautical record, you have to take off and land in your same aircraft, spacecraft in this case, because they wrote these, these uh, laws uh, how to keep track of records before there were spacecraft. But you have to take off and land in, your, in the same thing. Problem was, we weren't sure 
we, the Soviets weren't sure if, if the landing was survivable. So they actually had Gagarin eject and come down by his own parachute. And uh, they didn't tell people this because it would have ruined their, their official record. <laughs> the Soviet space program was very secretive. A lot of stuff happened that they did not tell us about. I've got some examples like this today. But there, eventually find out. The, oh, we'd, we'd eventually find out when it didn't matter anymore, when the world said, yes, he was officially the first. Right. Who cares about the rules? Okay. He was first. And he actually orbited the Earth. We're going to get to the Americans who couldn't quite orbit either because we're, our rockets were smaller and, and not as powerful. Um, interesting thing is he, he lands in some uh, farmer's field and he's carrying his parachute and he's wearing this silvery spacesuit. And a uh, farmer sees him and she thinks it's an alien and goes at him with a pitchfork. <laughs> Said, no, 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 comrade. I am, uh, I am Soviet just like you. Uh, I'm, I'm a cosmonaut just returned. I need to call Moscow now. Uh, but look, if he needed to talk faster, he would have gotten a few holes in his spacesuit from that pitchfork. So now every year we have what we call the World Space Party, uh, Yuri's Night, to celebrate the, uh, the launch, which happened uh, April 14th. It's a thing. We do that at NASA centers and, and elsewhere because we recognize that accomplishment. It was an amazing accomplishment. Somebody had to be first. Um, so the Americans, of course, decide we need to do this. So we... we Recruited an astronaut corps, seven astronauts, and uh, that is Al Shepard. He was the first American astronaut, and uh, there is his uh, Mercury spacecraft on top of a Redstone rocket. And, but it was not even an orbital flight. It was just an up and a down, a parabolic. It was like a cannon shot. He fired up off of Florida, went up high, pitched over, and then splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean some several thousand miles downrange. Uh, interesting little backstory, though. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how stuff works in the space program. So they um, put him in the, in the capsule, and they bolt everything tight, and he's got all the sen medical sensors on him, and, and he's in that spacesuit. And But there, there's some problem somewhere, some electrical issue. So they spend hours and hours trying to, to address that while he is sitting in that capsule. Now, imagine, look at that, that picture there. He is in this chair, except... There he is in, in the capsule. He's lying on his back like this. And after being in there for several hours, having, having your typical astronaut breakfast, eggs, coffee, toast, coffee, tang, coffee, and, and maybe some more coffee. Uh, after several hours, he calls back to mission control and says, hey, could you guys let me out? I, um, <clears throat> I have to go. What do you mean? You ha I, I've been in here for a long time. I gotta go. And they had this huddle because they didn't want to unbolt everything and bring the gantry arm back. And so they had this, this little quick chat with the medical staff. So can if the medical sensors, if it gets wet, will they be shorter or whatever? Uh, we'll just turn it off. So no, the astronaut will stay in the capsule, somebody says in a German accent, I don't know who. And uh, so what they decided to do is they turned off all the medical sensors that were attached to his body. He's laying on his back, no, no adult diaper. Does what he needs to do, turns everything back on, and then he launches. So imagine you're launching. You're being pushed into the back of your couch with this yellow puddle at the back now, <laughs> what it smells like inside your spacesuit. These are the stories of the spice program that uh, <laughs> did not get quite as much press. But it shows that uh, there are the things that we know, things we don't know, and the things we don't know we don't know. Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense of the United States, has one of my favorite quotes. The known unknowns, the unknown unknowns, the stuff we don't have a clue. Uh, you do testing like this, to, you know, nobody thought about what if he's in there too long? Might need a diaper, might be a good thing. But we launched him up, goes uh, splashes in the Atlantic Ocean, we pull him out, and gets a presidential welcome. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. The president wanted to commit the nation to a goal that we were tired of being second behind the Soviets at every step. And the president wanted a goal that was far enough down the road that we could actually catch up uh, because we were obviously way behind in the space race at this point. It was a matter of national prestige 
it was a, a matter where political science was at least as hard as rocket science. This is a time when we're, the, the president is coming and asking for billions of dollars to be spent on space exploration in a time when we were busy doing a lot of other things, the war on poverty, that war in Vietnam, real shooting war, the Cold War around the, uh, around the world. But uh, we ramped up space exploration. We needed a solid success, Al Shepard's flight, before the president could commit to something that was far enough down the road. But even then, it wasn't popular. Uh, at its best, the Apollo program had 40% approval rating from the general public. And the only way this is finagled, the, pol the political science, is pork projects for senators. If you vote for the space program, I'll let you get your freeway. Politics at its worst or best, your, your pick. Um, it was unfortunate that that president was assassinated, but it probably helped the space program. Because at that point, it became Kennedy's legacy. He died for the nation. We're going to do this. But as soon as we succeeded the Apollo program, we kind of wrapped it up. We even have rockets that we had built and paid for that we decided we're not, we're not going to launch those. But I'm, that's teasing next week. We'll talk about the challenge of the space program. But we started building uh, the access to do this. This is the Russian rocket in Vostok. And the next thing that they had to do, of course, after a launch is, uh, after a one-person capsule, is a two-person capsule. And after a two-person capsule is uh, maybe a spacewalk. So. This is not a real photograph, it's artistic rendering, but that is uh, astronaut Alexei Leonov, the first walk in space. And you can see there's this, um, you can kind of see how it's pleated on the side. This is a fabric structure, an airlock that comes off the side. Uh, it expanded, and so he could go in there, put on a spacesuit, open up the hatch, and come on out. And when he was done, he would go back in the hatch, close the door, um, lose the spacesuit, go inside the space capsule, and then drop that thing away. So that is a temporary structure. And here's the pictures of the first spacewalk, Alexei Leonov. But things we found out later, because the Soviets were very secretive. Look, look at his arm right there. Does he look really stiff? Does he look like he could really move very much? No. We didn't really appreciate when you are in uh, zero atmosphere how hard it is to be inside a balloon and try to move from inside the balloon. And he. He actually had a very difficult time moving inside his spacesuit. But wait, there was more. His spacesuit expanded enough that he could not fit back in the hatch. Like being inside a balloon, his spacesuit expanded. He could not get back in the spacecraft. And Soviet mission control said to his partner that if he can't get back in, cut him loose. That's a motivator, you know, if you're in that situation. Well, give him my choices. So what Leonov actually did, uh, he actually opened up a valve on his spy suit and let out a goodly portion of his air, and before he died of asphyxiation, clawed his way back into the air lock, closed it up behind him, and uh, he, he got back in there safely. But the unknown unknowns, things you don't know until you go doing them. The American answer to that is a program called Gemini, or NASA prefers to call it Gemini, but I'm an astronomer, so I'll call it Gemini. Uh, the two-person spacecraft, compared to Mercury, uh, Mercury is the one-person capsule, like Al Shepard and the others flew, on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, much bigger rocket, much more capable, or spacecraft. Um, to give you a sense of scale, Mercury, Gemini, and then we're going to talk about Apollo next week and also the size of the rockets you need to do these. So the Atlas rocket, the Titan rocket, the Saturn V, the biggest rocket ever built, still to this day, the biggest rocket ever made, to the kind of energy you need, all that fuel and all that rocket engine to get yourself further away. Cool thing about uh, Gemini, though, Mercury was, uh, was difficult to control, and it was, it was spam in a can. The astronauts had very little control over what they would do inside of there. But Gemini, uh, one of the astronauts, John Young, I've met a dozen astronauts over the years and talked to them about the program. John Young was, was one of my favorites. And John told me that flying Gemini was like driving a sports car. By the way, all the astronauts in this, in this era all had Corvettes. 
GM made a deal, which was great for the astronauts and great for GM. <laughs> what color Corvette would you like, Mr. Astronaut? We will get that to you. So when they compared that to a sports car, they did that with good reason. Um, by the way, this is an actual photograph taken from another Gemini spacecraft. There are skills that you have to learn and master before you can go to the moon. Spacewalking is one. You have to be able to rendezvous with other spacecraft. You have this spacecraft that's hurtling around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour, and another one at 17,500 miles an hour. Can you bring them together? Can they coordinate the orbits and, uh, and potentially even dock? And Gemini proved that you could do that before you can go to Apollo. Um, I don't want to get too deep into this, but as a, as a historian of the space program, Gemini could have gotten us to the moon if we had uh, kept going on this program, um, if we wanted a fast and dirty way to do it. Um, it could have worked. So we did our own spacewalks. This is Ed White and uh, the first American spacewalk. And we didn't know the Soviets had such a hard time. Alexei Linov uh, almost being cast off by his crewmate. Um, so we, uh, we went in without the lessons that we could have learned from, from the Soviets, or they've been a bit better at sharing. But our first spacewalk was very successful. Um, in his right hand is a canister with nitrogen gas, a little jet, so he can push a toggle switch, kind of like a, a fire extinguisher, and he could jet himself around. Uh, he was, the spacewalk was only supposed to last for 10 minutes, and he was out there for 15 and said, Oh, Ma, do I have to come in? Do I have to? Do I have to go to bed? I don't want to. I've got two daughters, by the way, named Trouble and More Trouble. I'm watching you two. We'll go out you figure it out. About this same time is, I would argue, the best science fiction movie of all time. And it has withstood the, the decades between then and now very, very well. If you watch it, it is still an extraordinarily well done movie. Um, it is a vision of space that uh, I think is really worthwhile. So that's the early part of the program. Uh, next week, we're going to go to the moon, and we're going to talk about the planets in our solar system. I do have a teaser for you, though. I would argue that this is the most beautiful astronomy picture of all time. Now, I got into astronomy in large part. I mean, I grew up with it. My dad was in the space program. I have been a space nut ever since I was your age. My entire life, I grew up knowing I was going to do this. Uh, and astronomy is a beautiful science, as opposed to chemistry, the science of stinky things, biology, the science of slimy things. Um, astronomy is the science of beautiful things. This is a picture taken of Saturn, obviously, by the Cassini mission. So Cassini flew back behind Saturn. It's in an eclipse of Saturn. The sun is on the far side. So the rings are backlit. So we could really see the rings in detail in the outer atmosphere. In fact, this ring right here, we didn't know it was here until we took this picture. If you're going to explore a planet, it's nice to know where all the rings are <laughs> so you don't crash into them. Kind of a good thing. So all of that makes for a gorgeous picture, but there's one more thing. One more thing that takes this picture from beautiful to sublime. See that wee little dot right there? That's us. Really? That's home. That's Earth. That's what Earth looks like from a billion miles away. Saturn's a billion miles away from the Earth. Wow. That's cool. That is cool. That is cool. By the way, Jupiter and Saturn are at their very best for the year. And I'm going to welcome you to come to the observatory. I will show. It won't look like this. Uh, we have a planetarium at Cranbrook where we've got uh, six different programs going. Uh, the new program, I haven't seen, I'm going to see this on Friday. I haven't seen this yet. Capcom Go, the Apollo story. We have programs, Young Stargazers, Michigan Sky, Big Bird's Adventure, one of my favorites, uh, and Pink, Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd. Yeah. So you can go to our website, science.edu, cranbrook.science.edu, and um, you can see what, uh, what programs we have, what day, what times, and I'd welcome you to come. And there's the observatory. And the observatory is um, uh, every Friday and Saturday night from 8.30 till 10. Pick a clear night, come on up. It's me that's included with admission to the museum. Uh, we also do sun viewing on the first Sunday of each month. Sun viewing on Sunday. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for the cheap jokes. And we'd love to have you there. 
Uh, but this is the kind of stuff we can see. I'm going to stick around for anybody who's got questions. But um, next week, we're going to talk about Apollo. In two weeks, we're going to talk about the SLS and Web and the others. Thanks, guys. Thank Come back, please. We will.